This is part two of the series, Reprojecting Sport Player GPS Tracking Data. So in this part, I want to go into the theory behind reprojecting coordinate systems. And th the reason I need to go into depth in this is because although there exist commercial tools that can reproject GPS data automatically for you. These tools are often designed for professional surveyors and engineers, which means without a good understanding of what's going on underneath, it's very easy to make mistakes. Um, and in particular with these tools, you can end up with subtle mistakes, which may go undetected until it's too late. Starting off with the basics, GPS uses the WGS84 coordinate system. It's a geocentric system where the center of the coordinate system is at the center of Earth, or at least where we think that is. It approximates the Earth to an ellipsoid, which I know you can't really see it there, but at the equator it is slightly larger than at the poles. Here's an exaggerated diagram to show you what I mean. Basically, the rotation of Earth causes that radius A to be 0.3% greater than the radius at B. Or more accurately, since we're now dealing with an ellipse cross-section, we'd call A the semi-major axis and B the semi-minor axis. Longitude is angle east of the prime meridian and latitude is angle north of the equator. Hopefully no surprises there. An interesting sidetrack is the prime meridian isn't at quite the same location as the historic Greenwich meridian line. There's an article reference below if you're interested in how the deflection of gravity has caused those two to diverge slightly. For measuring latitude, there's an important subtlety that I want to address. When we're working with an ellipsoidal Earth, height is measured normal to that ellipsoid. It's also the direction of gravity, or at least the approximate direction of gravity. One way to think about that is if the ellipsoid was covered in water, then gravity is going to be normal to that surface because water is usually flat. Now, that line normal to the surface doesn't actually go through the center of the Earth, which means gravity also doesn't go through to the center of the Earth, which is what we're used to thinking about. So the important subtlety here in the definition of latitude is latitude is the angle from the equator to that line normal to the surface of Earth, which is not the same as the angle from the center of Earth to the point on the surface. Just something to be aware of if you're trying to do the calculations yourself. So for centuries, map makers have had to deal with the problem how do we take a 3D spherical, or more accurately, ellipsoidal Earth and project it onto a two-dimensional map? Now, they've come up with ways that we can preserve distances, we can preserve angles, we can preserve areas, but unfortunately, it's impossible to preserve all three of those qualities on a two-dimensional map at the same time. As a result, we have different map projections for different purposes. So for example, a political map should preserve areas, whereas a map for navigation, you probably want to preserve compass directions. Of course, nowadays with computerized maps, we can have the exact 3D loca 
indications. And then whenever you draw a line to measure distance in the software, or you try to measure an angle, the software could do the exact calculations over the curved surface, surface of the Earth to give you the precise answer. That said, the computations to do that are slightly computationally expensive. So for small regions, such as a sports field, it makes perfect sense to want to approximate to 2D. The calculations are going to be quicker, and it also means that we have access to the full range of ordinary 2D geometric analysis techniques rather than having to use specialized algorithms that work over the curved Earth. So you may still be wondering, why can't we just use x equals longitude, y equals latitude as our axes and call that the projection? Well, you could, but it would be a very bad projection. And the reason is, in terms of those three properties that I discussed before, distance, angle, area, using longitude and latitude directly as your axes won't preserve any of those qualities. Your latitude, at least if we approximate the Earth to a sphere, is going to have a fairly constant scale with the distance that it represents. In the longitude direction, however, things are much different. So at the equator, one degree of longitude is approximately 111 kilometers, whereas at the pole, a rotation of longitude isn't going to do anything. It represents zero meters. And because we have these different scales in longitude and latitude, things can get distorted. So to make this more concrete, I've taken a test point at the Melbourne Cricket Ground, and it turns out that if we had a perfect circle one meter east, one meter north in reality, when we convert that to longitudes and latitudes, that one meter east is 3.5 by 10 to the minus nine degrees east, whereas the one meter north is 2.7 by 10 to the minus degree, nine degrees north. And we end up with the distorted ratio, which makes it look like that second image there where everything's squashed. This gives us the wrong angle measurements, it gives us the wrong distance measurements, it gives us the wrong area measurements. So what can we do? Well, the simplest way would be simply to correct for the scale in each dimension. How do we calculate it? It turns out it's really easy to calculate that scale if we know the radius of curvature. Mathematically, radius of curvature turns out to just be the ratio ds there along the surface of a curve to d theta, the change in angle. These formulas work out much better when we're using radians. If you use degrees, things don't work out this nicely. On a spherical Earth, calculating that radius of curvature is really simple because it turns out that radius of curvature just is the radius of Earth, which is the scale of distance over the curve to our change of latitude or longitude. On an ellipsoid Earth, however, things are a bit more complicated. It turns out there's two different radiuses of curvature depending upon whether we're moving in the longitude or latitude direction. For completeness, I've included the formulas here. These are all taken from the reference at the bottom of the slide there. Basically, to calculate the distance we travel in the north, we just take the rm radius there and multiply by the latitude. 
to calculate the distance we travel in the east, we take the Rn radius. The cos phi there is because the rotation is usually about the poles. We don't rotate through the full circle. And multiply by the change in longitude. As you can see, the formulas below are a little bit complicated due to the ellipsoid surface. That said, it is mostly just trigonometry and square roots, so there's nothing there we can't compute just using high school math. To implement this efficiently, we can use transformation matrix. We take the difference in latitude and longitude to some reference points, say the center of our football stadium, and then we use that 2 by 2 transformation matrix in the middle there to scale each dimension using those radiuses of curvature. The result is a vector representing the local meters in the east direction and local meters in the north direction. Now if we had a field that was oriented differently, uh, like I said some fields are oriented east-west, others are oriented north-south, we could easily pre-multiply by another rotation matrix just to rotate everything by that compass direction so that all our fields are orientated the same way. This method isn't perfect. So firstly, um, the method as I've presented here wouldn't work very well when we cross the 180 degree meridian line. When we jump from positive 180 to negative 180, obviously that's gonna cause everything to fail. Perhaps we could get around that by using modulo though. The fundamental problem with this technique is that we've assumed a constant scale over the area of our map in each dimension. In reality, as I mentioned, the scale factors actually vary a lot with your latitude so for large regions, that becomes an important consideration. To give a specific example, if we take the extreme case that this stadium were at the North Pole and that center was the North Pole, when we calculate the scale factors, we'd end up with a scale factor of zero because at the North Pole, any rotation of longitude produces no distance. And if we were to use this technique, that would actually cause all of the longitudes to come out zero, so everything would be projected to a straight line rather than a circle as we know we have. So you can see uh, there are some edge cases where this technique completely breaks down. For a more mathematically sound approach, we can set up local coordinate reference frames and use matrix rotation to rotate the entire Earth in 3D. Now, unlike the previous technique with scale factors, this doesn't have those edge cases at the North Pole. We can set up our local reference frame anywhere and it should be fine. So to do this, we start by converting everything from latitude, longitude, height to so-called Earth-centered, Earth-fixed, X, Y, Z coordinates that are all relative to the absolute center of Earth. We then rotate the global coordinate system in order to match up our local frame tangent to the surface of Earth there. And we can do that using rotation and transformation matrices. Here are the formulas to convert latitude, longitude, height to x, y, z. These are taken from the reference at the bottom there. And we can see they're quite similar to the 
calculations that we saw for the previous method. Once we've converted all our coordinates to absolute x, y, z, we take the vector of each of our GPS points to our reference point, which could, for example, be the center of the football field. Then we pre-multiply by that 3 by 3 rotation matrix in the middle there, which reorientates our global coordinates such that they face with the x, y, z now in the east, north, and local up direction. Now, this technique isn't unique to geography. I've actually used a similar technique before in robotics where we want to know the location of objects relative to the robots and actuator. That's the claw. Um, also, if we wanted, we could correct for the local compass orientation of the fields, much like with the previous technique, where we just rotate through by another transformation matrix to deal with some fields being north-south, some fields being east-west. An interesting variation of this technique by Defence Science and Technology Group Australia is that they carried out the computations symbolically and approximated to a Taylor series along the way. By doing so, they were able to come up with a formula that gave them a three times speed improvement, which helped speed up their war simulations. But because they neglected some of the higher order terms, it comes at the cost of some accuracy. So the point I want to make here is that we have a choice between accuracy and computational efficiency and which method we use really depends upon our distances because further away from the reference point the distortion gets worse and what accuracies we require. Finally, I want to talk about Hodine's oblique Mercator, also known as the Rectified Skew Orthomorphic Projection. Now, this, is, unlike the other techniques, is a real projection that cartographers might seriously consider for mapping small portions of the world. We can see an example of this in the image I've created on the left there where the projection lets us choose an arbitrary center point. In this case, I've chosen Melbourne, so everything's centered around that, and that's where our distortion is minimal. It also lets us choose a direction for the central line, which we're going to attempt to preserve the scale along. So in this case, I've chosen my central knot line in the east direction. In the case of a sports match, you might choose the central line to be in the directions of the goalposts, and then the entire projection is going to be reorientated around that. So that's a nice feature that we can set the orientation however we like. Unfortunately, away from that central line, we can't perfectly preserve all of the angle distance area properties that we'd like. Um, in this case, the Hodine's Oblique Mercator tries to preserve the local angles, but as you can see in that image there, there's quite a lot of scale distortion as we move away from the central line. So you can see um, quite a lot of distortion in the parts that jut out of Antarctica and South America there. So, in summary, we have seen there are lots of techniques that can be used to reproject GPS data into a local coordinate system 
and preserve certain properties as accurately as possible. When we're dealing with small regions such as a sports stadium, in honesty any of these techniques would probably be accurate enough because there's really not a lot of distortion due to the curvature of earth on something small like a football stadium. That said, we still need to be aware about all this theory to make sure that we pick one of the projections that works and make sure we pick our projections such that our reference point is at the stadium rather than somewhere else because once you move away from the reference point you end up with serious distortions using any of these methods. Which method to choose comes down to a computational speed accuracy trade-offs. So we can see the correcting for scale is probably one of the fastest, but it's also one of the worst approximations. For larger areas, say we were dealing with some sort of boat race, then we might want to use one of the more accurate projections that takes into account the curvature of Earth, like the hot iron's oblique Mercator. So that covers all the theory. We're now safe to move on to studying the user interface that geographic information tools present to users so they can actually try and use some of this theory in practice to reproject our sports data or whatever other kind of data we have.